So thank you for joining us for this new uh, edition of the ICA International Webinar dedicated to, uh, to Mash Trust. I just want to remind you to keep your microphone off uh, and to leave your uh, comments and questions in the chat section. Thank you very much. Um, I remind you as well that the um, webinar is uh, being recorded and uh, the record will be pu published on our uh, YouTube channel and website um, probably next week. Um, so thank you, enjoy, and I will give the floor to Lisbeth Rebelo Gonzalez, our president. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I'm very much honored to open this webinar where the third book published by ICA International in the Art Critics of the World series is launched. This volume is an anthology of writings by the Zlova critic published by ICA Press and Le Presse du Réel Dijon with our financial support from Contact, the art collection of Erst Group and Erst Foundation. This book is the result of a proposal from our Slovak colleagues at the time of organizing ICA's 46th International Congress in 2013. It recognizes the achievement of a former colleague who joined ICA Czechoslovakia in 1966 when ICA held its second Congress behind the Iron Curtain. I want to salute Daniel Groom and Andrea Oringer Batorova and express my gratitude for their participation in this event. I salute the audience and I salute, of course, Jean-Marc Ponceau, Chair of ICAS Publication Committee and Harry Merritt Hughes, to whom I will give the floor for the introduction and moderation of the event. Thank you and welcome. Please, thank you. Thank you very much, Lisbeth, for your kind words and for your support for this project from the very beginning, which has been immensely valuable to us. And welcome to all of you. I'll introduce our distinguished speakers uh, shortly. Um, and I'd, uh, so I'll start straight away. As there's quite a lot to discuss, and I don't want to take too much floor time. Um, those of you wishing to read more about uh, Thomas Strauss may also wish to refer to the short preview of the publication in French by Mathilde Arnoux on pages 151 to 152 of number 54 of the Revue Critique d'Art of spring 19, uh, 2020. And at greater length in the excellent review in English by one of this afternoon's speakers, Andrea Oeringer Batarova in Art Margins, I'm oh, sorry, Art Margins on the 5th of February 2021. Andrea's review is um, uh, accessible on the ICA, on the main page of the ICA International website. <clears throat> this short but dense anthology of essays by Thomas Strauss owes its origins to the enterprise of AICA Slovakia in organizing the association's annual congress with the very appropriate title, White Places and Black Holes, referring to memory lapses and recuperation. In Bratislava and Košice in the east of Slovakia, uh, from the 27th to the 29th of September 2013, and I'm delighted that uh, uh, Jura Vatai, who is the president of ICA then, is with us today. Um, it celebrated, uh, the Congress celebrated Kozhitsa's return to the limelight as European city of culture, and in particular were indebted to Vladimir Beshki to organize the cultural year. Yura, I have just referred to Chani, and Richard Gregor, all three of them AICA members, incidentally, for their initiative in proposing Thomas Strauss for AICA's award for a lifetime's achievement, posthumously, alas, as he had died only a few months before. And to Susanna Bartosova, who has accompanied projects throughout, and Katrin Romberg, the director of Contact, the art collection of Erster Gruppe and Erster Foundation Vienna, without whose financial contribution, 
this publication would not have been possible. I cannot end this brief list of acknowledgements without mentioning our two sorely tested translators. Um, Haley Haupt for the last essay in the book, which he translated from German, and in particular, Jonathan Owen, who surmounted all kinds of linguistic obstacles, as you will perhaps sense. A very important element for us, however, as editors of Art Critics of the World, has been to try and ensure that everything we do for the series is both literate and readable, which, alas, happens so seldom to be the case. Who was Thomas Strauss, and why does he seem so little known in the English-speaking world? Closely following Daniel Gruden's introduction, to which I'm greatly indebted uh, for what follows, Thomas Strauss was born in 1931 in Budapest, where he spoke Hungarian, of course, in addition to his schooling in Czech and fluency in German. Uh, he spoke other languages, I believe, too, but not so much English, although he could correspond in English. He studied aesthetics in Prague, but his professional career took off after he settled in Bratislava to teach an aesthetics seminar at the Comenius University. First as assistant professor from 1966, and as associate professor in the history and theory of art, and as leader of the Department of Aesthetics. His personal evolution in this role, matched by a gradual re revision of orthodox Marxist doctrine and departure from the usual preoccupation with the issue of realism towards a, more, a kind of new left approach to aesthetics. Uh, happily coincided with the burgeoning of what became known as the Prague Spring under the political leadership of Alexander Dubček, himself a Slovak, but always reflected at one remove in Slovakia, which was often perceived as a junior, less technologically advanced partner in the Czechoslovak Federation. As an important parenthesis, it's worth noting here that Strauss joined IECA in 1966 at the time of the highly significant Ninth IECA International Congress, as Lisbeth said, only the second to have been held by Andy Ann Curtin, when Jindrich Stercelupetsky was one of the most important contributors, along with Miroslav Mitsko from Czechoslovakia and Julius Starzynski from Poland, who were two of the association's vice presidents, and art critics from the West, including Pierre Restani, his friend Michel Ragon and Raoul Jean Moulin from the communist newspaper L'Humanité, who all covered the event for their papers or magazines in the West. The theme of the Congress, the essence and function of art criticism, would have immediately appealed to Strauss from the outset, and Alex Minarchik and Stano Fulco, young artists, staged an inst the installation performance in the public toilet as an unofficial sideshow to the Congress program in Bratislava, were among the earliest Slovak contemporary artists to receive Strauss's critical support. In the 1960s, Strauss was among the foremost Czechoslovak institutions and art theorists, commenting freely on artistic events both at home and abroad. Early on, he took an interest in the historic avant-garde of both East and West before Europe became brutally divided in the Cold War and engaged at first hand with a young generation of Slovak artists who began to emerge in those heady days of socialism with a human face. He traveled and lectured widely in West Germany and wrote about events such as the Fifth Paris Biennale, 1967, the Venice Biennale and Documenta IV, both in 1968. And his closest collaborators at the time included Yindris Chalupetsky in Prague, author of a book on Duchamp in, I think, 1966, and the Austrian Werner Hoffmann, who was founding director of Vienna's Museum of the 20th Century, which opened in 1962. In August 1968, after the invasion of Warsaw Pact forces, Strauss took the heavy decision to return to Czechoslovakia. And if you permit an autobiographical digression, I myself moved to West Berlin in that month in an official capacity and witnessed the flight there of a number of Czechoslovakian artists and intellectuals, sometimes aided by the West Berlin Senate and the German Academic Service, the DAB 
and I particularly recall anguished choice that the well-known Czech painter Jan Kultik faced when he decided to invite his family to join him there and settle in West Germany for a life of permanent exile. The period of normalization from 1968 to 1972, which Germans might have called Gleichschaltung under the Third Reich, made life increasingly difficult for the senders, the centers, leading to Strauss losing his university position and finding the doors of many publishers closed to him. He was still able to bring out a book on op art in 1969 and a monograph on the Hungarian constructivist Lajos Kaszak in 1975, but a book he prepared on neoplasticism was pulped immediately after publication in 1972, and he increasingly resorted, increasingly resorted to semi-step publications, articles, and at least one full-length book, Art of the Future, that were painstakingly copied and passed from hand to hand. A book that he wrote in manuscript on the Slovak variants of modernism reflected his status as a key theoretician of the neo-avant-garde and his addition to a parallel community, cultural community. Exhausted by the struggle to survive, Strauss left Czechoslovakia from West Germany in 1980 and spent over a decade there organizing exhibitions for the Wilhelm Lehmburg Museum in Duisburg, the Kunstmuseum in Hannover, and the Ludwig Forum Aachen, as well as contributing regularly to the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung and writing longer essays of which one is included in this anthology. Throughout his self-imposed exile in West Germany and after his return to Czechoslovakia, later Slovakia, from the 1990s after his death in 2013, Schloss was concerned with reinterpreting the canon of artistic modernism and reasserting the centrality of art from his own region of Central Europe for its pivotal importance to the development of a holistic view of European art. Not by chance, then, you will find a selection of three key essays in the first part of this publication on Koshitsa in the early 1920s at the point of confluence of intellectual currents from three former empires, Austro-Hungarian, Russian and Ottoman, and on the composer Bela Bartok and the artist and editor of Ma, Lajos Pashak. Before I go on to introduce our speakers, I'm, I, I must apologize to Jean Marc, who is going first of all to introduce this series, which is the overall editor, uh, Jean Marc Poinceau. I'm extremely sorry, I was so uh, concerned about time, but I'd like very much to pass the uh, mic to you, if I may, first of all. Uh, Jean Marc is going to tell us uh, about the series, which is the overall editor, and of course. Um, the three editors of this volume are Jean-Marc himself and Daniel Gruen and me, and uh, how this particular volume uh, fits into the, the overall concept of a series of uh, writers who are little known uh, outside their own linguistic uh, sphere in translation. Um, and maybe Jean-Marc can say better than I about the availability of these publications at the same time. So uh, with apologies, may I hand the... Um, microphone back to you and then I'll introduce our speakers afterwards. So, um, the ICA Press series, Art Critics of the World, is directly linked to the award for distinguished contribution to art criticism. Each volume is dedicated to selected writings of the critic chosen by the country that host our international congress. Ticio Escobar from Paraguay won the, won the first prize in 2011. The Invention of Distance a selection of several essays was published in a bilingual volume inspired by Walter Benjamin and the Indians. It was published in 2013. It was followed by Thomas Kraus from Slovakia, distinguished in 2013 
and published in 2020. So it was a long, a long, a very long process to get this book. Uh, seven essays on European avant-garde from East and West composed is this volume, Beyond the Great Divide. Uh, the title is Beyond the Great Divide. Then, uh, excuse me. Then Lille for South Korea won the prize in 2014, but his book was issued in 2018. Selected writings on Korean current contemporary art under the expand the title Expansion and Reduction was the first volume which I edited uh, as uh, uh, the first volume was edited by uh, Marek Bartedic, uh, who was also at the initiative of, uh, of the prize. Uh, so uh, after, after this, uh, this first volume, uh, he asked me to to take the, the chair for the publication uh, committee inside the, the bureau, uh, the IK bureau. Uh, so uh, the, the legal book uh, was under the title Expansion and Reduction, and it was the first volume which, uh, which was prepared with Chung Yun Shim, a Korean specialist with the help of Henry Mary Hughes. There is something which I must uh, uh, underline is uh, uh, the fact that Henry was always there uh, as an invisible uh, or visible uh, pattern of this, uh, this series. Uh, so uh, this book was prepared with the, the ideas that uh, the translation which was given to us by uh, the Korean people was not exactly uh, what we must expect from uh, reference series. So uh, we had to, to, to rewrite it. And it was with the help of Paul O'Kane and Bada Song. Uh, then we experienced in this first volume uh, the possibilities of a double introduction, that is to say, an introduction from uh, uh, an historian, art historian, or uh, a specialist of the country, and in, an introduction of the country, uh, the, the country uh, uh, of the receiver, the English uh, reader. Uh, so uh, we, we, I, I discovered uh, during the preparation of this book uh, that uh, Lee Hill has spent uh, several years in France to finish his French literature and art history studies. And that it, at that time, it was also uh, an important moment, an historical moment uh, for Korean artist emergence on the international contemporary art scene. Paris Biennale was a place where Lee Hill met uh, these artists for the first time. It was also for him the opportunity to uh, to introduce their contributions in several catalogues, several biennial 
bien of Paris catalogs. So uh, these these uh, these texts were not in the 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 Greek anthology that was published in Korean language, uh, and uh, it was added afterwards uh, after the research and the publication of the of this book uh, of uh, uh, our book. Uh, I did not share, I must admit that I did not share the same familiarity with Daniel Grun. It, it was that, the situation at that time, at the beginning of uh, our common work, who had prepared an excellent and long list of contents. And at that time, there was no money from ICA. So I asked him several times to cut some, uh, some of them it was uh, difficult to do it, and uh, but uh, we arrived to uh, set uh, a very interesting version, which uh, uh, you are introducing now uh, in this discussion. Uh, I must. Uh, I must recognize that uh, I have put Daniel out of patience with the, in this process. Now, I must apologize for that. Nevertheless, Henry Mary Hughes was there. He came and helped us, and finally the book was printed after a close collaboration between Daniel Brun, John, Jonathan Owen, the translator from the Slovak, and Henry, who knows very well, as he reminded us in a, some minutes ago, the Metal Europa uh, art scene. And the result, I must say, is quite exciting. The new president support also uh, had helped a lot. Thank you, Lisbeth. <laughs> Uh, Walter Grascamp came in 2020. His book was titled The Angel Vanishes. Uh, it's also the title of a small essay uh, in, uh, in the book itself. Uh, he gathered 19 monographic papers and essays, mainly on German contemporary artists. It was a result of the debate on the contents chosen by Walter Grascamp, Dan Daniel Perrier, who was a general, uh, the German uh, editor, and Gerard Goudreau, the translator, were stimulated all together by uh, the presence of Henry, uh, always very active during the phase of translation the phases of translation. As I did not choose the authors by myself, I must acknowledge that these books written by two generations of art critics, mainly one uh, around, uh, born around the 30s, uh, Lee Yill and, uh, and uh, Thomas Kranz, and one around the 40s with, uh, for instance, Walter Grascamp. Uh, uh, this, don't, this book written by two generations of art critics from all, over the, from all over the world contained such an exciting and stimulating uh, con uh, series of articles uh, that uh, it could be uh, an, an uh, art critics books series of refer of reference book uh, useful for for the art history students and uh, art uh, art ex art criticism students when the teachers 
will have taken the time to read them. So I encourage, encourage every of you to be the uh, ambassadors of uh, this series, to uh, <laughs> the professors in, in uh, the art schools and art uh, history of art uh, universities. Um, so uh, I don't speak anymore now. Perhaps uh, I'm going to ask some things later. Uh, and just uh, I, I just want to uh, remember you that you have special conditions uh, if you buy directly uh, the book to uh, uh, the the office, the ICA office, or uh, by multi a multiple of ten by the press du Ré. Uh, it's nearly a uh, half price because uh, we have to 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 add uh, the the mail uh, the price of the mail. So, uh, Henry, I give you back. To me. Right. Thank you again. I'm so sorry. I was so anxious to get my piece off my chest <laughs> that uh, it would be mo more logical to have heard you first. But I would just like to say what a, what a huge pleasure it's been to work with you, Jean-Marc, in particular on this series. And the way that you've, you've developed, I think, a, a, a format which is durable and flexible uh, for bringing to the attention of wider audiences some of the best critics, many of whom have been associated with AICA, uh, in rather more, uh, in some of the, uh, is it the white spots or the black, uh, I can't remember, <laughs> you or I will tell me. In any way, the, the uh, parts of, of our uh, common history, European and global art history, which have been overlooked or neglected unjustly, and often only for linguistic reasons and geographical or political reasons. Uh, incidentally, there are two common points of interest. Jean-Marc was mentioning about a Grasskamp uh, anthology, which is out shortly. Uh, and he mentions that uh, talks at some length about the exhibition Westkunst in 1981 uh, in Cologne. And uh, you will find quite a lot in, in uh, Thomas Strauss's uh, book, too about the importance or otherwise of best kunst and, and the notion that um, European art as a whole has a much broader base and a much longer history than a Cold War vision of what best kunst might be. Anyway, at this point, I'd like to introduce you to our two main speakers this evening who engage in an, in an approximately 30 minutes dialogue on three topics in particular covered by the essays included in this anthology. There are Central European art between East and West, Ost-West, if you like. First of all, conceptualism, secondly, and action art of the 1960s and 1970s. And thirdly, negotiating East European art. And I hope that then there will be a brief opportunity for discussion between the speakers, including I hope Jean-Marc, followed by an opportunity for Q&A from the audience. Um, and at this point, I should mention, you can put questions or comments on the chat button uh, on your screen, and we can, uh, as we go along. First of all, uh, Andrea Euringer Batarova, who will um, lead the discussion, is assistant professor at the Institute of Cultural Studies. Faculty of Arts, Comenius University, that's Strauss's old university in Bratislava. Her research focuses on alternative and unofficial art and its societal contextualization between the 1960s and 1980s in Eastern Europe, especially in former Czechoslovakia. She has published extensively in this field, most recently in her book, The Art of Contestation, performative practices in Slovakia in the 1960s and 1970s last year, and various books in German was before that. 
Our second speaker, who is co-editor with John Mark and me of uh, the Thomas Schaus publication, is Danielle Grun, uh, an art historian, curator, writer, and AICA member, as is uh, Andrea, working as assistant professor in the Department of Theory and History of Art at the Academy of Fine Arts and Design in Bratislava. He conducts research in the fields of Slovak conceptual art, East European art histories, and critical and documentary practices in the contemporary arts. As a researcher and curator, he is working on an international exhibition of the work of the Slovak artist Julius Kola. And in 2010, he won the Igor Zabel Award for Culture and Theory. So I'll hand over the floor, uh, if I may, perhaps to Andrea, who will kick off the discussion between herself and Danielle of, of the book that we're looking at. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Uh, hello to everybody all over the world. Uh, thank you very much uh, to ICA International for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here today and uh, to talk uh, about Thomas Strauss' anthology and about his work. Uh, this anthology is really a long-awaited anthology and uh, a substantive contribution uh, to art criticism and also to art history within East and West and beyond East and West. So I would like to express my compliment and recognition to the editors, uh, Henry Mary Hughes, uh, Jean-Marc Poinceau uh, and uh, Daniel Grun for uh, creating this great anthology. The thing is, uh, Thomas Strauss, uh, as Henry taught uh, already, published in Slovak and in German language. And actually, there are some texts which are published in German which are not translated into Slovak. So now also people in Slovakia who doesn't speak German have the possibility to read this text in English. So this is really great contribution also for a domestic art scene, not only for the international one. That's what I would like to underline. So uh, this anthology is divided into three parts in a chronological order from the avant-garde uh, to contemporary art or to the 1990s. Um, now we will go into a dialogue uh, with Daniel Grun. And first, I would like to ask Daniel about the first part, which is titled Central European Art Between East and West. Uh, what are your thoughts, Daniel, about this first part of Strauss' uh, essays? The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I, I would also like to, uh, to express my gratitude uh, and uh, I am really excited to, to be a uh, co-editor of this book of this, uh, and be part of ICAS series, Art Critics of the World. So let me, uh, let me start uh, maybe and uh, to respond to uh, a question that Andrea uh, posed. So I will try to introduce you to some key aspects of Thomas Strauss' thinking, areas of his interest in visual arts, aesthetics, and related disciplines. I will also focus on methods and interpretation procedures, as well as describe his attitudes and intentions as an art critic. In the first part, uh, we included uh, three essays. The first essay is dedicated to the composer Bela Bartok, the second to the artist Lajos Kashak, and the third examines the location of the city on the border between East and West, or, or Eastern and Western Europe, Košice, and its outstanding multicultural artistic scene. Hungarian composer Bela Bartok is seen by Strauss not only as an exceptional composer and founder of new expressive language, but also as a collector, historian, sociologist, and, and scientific experimentator. Strauss re-examines Bartok's exploration of the language of folk music in order to return its value that was abused 
by the concept of folkishness by Nazis. For his anti-fascist attitude and progressive artistic orientation, Bartók was accused of national betrayal in Horthy's Hungary. Tomasz Strauss claims that territory of Central and Eastern Europe is characterized by the rich diversity of its folk art process or process continuing over centuries, migration of forms, constant intermingling of different languages, traditions, and life experiences. Strauss points to the links between music and the visual arts. Bartók was well informed about avant-garde artistic developments in Eastern Europe. He had direct contact with Lajos Kashak and Journal Ma, Soviet constructivism and German Bauhaus. In his essay on Kashak, Strauss emphasizes the fact that Kashak was not only an outstanding formulator of ideas, but also as but also was practitioner of art. From 1967, Strauss worked on Kashak's inventory. Finally, he completed his research and published monography in 1975 in Cologne. Again, similarly to his essay on Bartók, Strauss points to substantial unity of theory and practice. For Strauss, Kashak achieved his artistic practice verbally, formulated ideas, painted or printed as visual works, agitational advertising posters. Strauss' approach towards visual arts could be characterized as embodiment of seemingly contrast, contrasting poles in the, understand, in the understanding of art. The third essay, in the first part is focused on Košice, eastern metropolis of the Czechoslovak Republic, which stood on the borders between Soviet Union, Poland and Hungary. While focusing on such antagonist positions as Jackson Pollock and David Alfaro Sigueros, uh, both shown at Kunsthalle Düsseldorf in 1995, in connection to work of Košice-based artist Anton Jasusz, Strauss attempts at dismantling the national optics on art. According to Strauss, artistic culture on all continents forms an interconnected, continuous whole. Strauss outlines a cyclical panorama of Central European art modeled by dialectics of oppositions and constant stressing unity of contradictions. Strauss describe, describes avant-garde as microcosmos or planetary system. For him, avant-garde has been moving in circles. Yet this circular movement, he claims, does not necessarily imply literal return and repetition, as Peter, Peter, Birger, Peter Birger would claim. Uh, Strauss says, I quote him, the circle sometimes turn into a spiral and then we are dealing with a retracing of the orbit on a new and higher level, end of quote. So these are my thoughts on the first part of the book dedicated to uh, to avant-garde uh, from Central uh, uh, and Eastern Europe. Maybe we, uh, you have uh, another question or we move to uh, the second part of the book. Yes, when I look at our time, I think we will move to the second part and which is conceptualism and action art in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, Actually, uh, we can consider Thomas Strauss as key person for unofficial artists and alternative art. Um, he was one of the points of reference for this, uh, for this artist, definitely. 
And uh, one of his uh, big contributions from that time was his Samistad, which was published uh, in 1978 and 1979, titled Slovak Variation of Modernity. I have here the version of uh, which was published then in 1992. Um, actually, this includes fundamental and essential studies on Slovak alternative and unofficial art. And since uh, I was uh, and I am involved in research of uh, unofficial art, it guided me this book from my first step of my research. And I think it's the way um, it happens to every student and every researcher that he has to start by reading Thomas Strauss and his son is that. So what is also interesting about this sum is that, that it, it consists not only of text, but also it consists and includes uh, correspondence. Uh, and it was uh, the way um, that he sent or gave this sum is that type, sum is that disseminated it to his friends and to his uh, uh, to his uh, artist he knew and uh, they wrote him their comments so they wrote him letters and after that even he wrote them back so what we have here is a testing probe and immersion to the intellectual space of that time it is very very precious material what we have here i have also a quote which i find very interesting from this uh, samistat uh, from his foreword, I quote, the position of art critic, a sovereign judge and not participating chronologist who stands apart is not arguable anymore. The closed essay, which was until now the only one form of critical evidence, is inescapably to change to a new open form in which all who are interested still can contribute by new interpretation." End of the quote. So in mention some is that his essays create an organic complex with his correspondence. And in Strauss' opinion, correspondence relieves the last sphere of aesthetic stylization, the existing border between the private and the public, which is not maintainable today anymore. So he considers the private thoughts about art, this kind of subject diary, as he called it, as a great contribution that is even more interesting than the result which the author decides to publish afterwards. So I would like to ask you, Daniel, what was the relation between Thomas Strauss and unofficial artists? And uh, tell us please more about these two essays which were included in this anthology. Uh, it's great that uh, two essays from this uh, book uh, are published in English now uh, in this anthology and uh, I would shortly introduce some of the key uh, moments, key ideas that Strauss in, uh, implies in his, uh, in his uh, writings. One of the leitmotifs of Strauss thinking is the cognitive property of art convergence of art and science does not necessarily mean that art takes over scientific methods, but on the contrary, Strauss emphasizes the specificity of artistic research. At the beginning of 1970s, Strauss marks the tendency towards intellectualization of artistic creation in Slovak art. For Strauss, point of departure uh, for conceptual art in Slovak context was predominantly painting. It was already in 1964 when Julius Koller introduced his painting More, the Sea, consisting of a painted inscription. Word Sea, More, is painted by gestural move of brush on the surface of canvas, evoking action painting as well as sizzling foam waves. Strauss develops the argument that it is not negation of classical art, but it is art's logical structural analysis within new con conditions of communication, mass media, and expanded 
sphere of art. In contrast to, in contrast to Fluxus, Strauss claims that the purpose of conceptual painting by Kohler is not the mockery of art, but rather the dissection of the medium, the specific analysis of its particular process of representation. Strauss speaks about the analysis through action. In his essay on conceptual art and its development in early 70s, he introduces four variations, the painted, sculptural, architectural, scientific variations. So four variations. Exemplifying uh, this process on key works by Alex Minarchik, Stano Filko, Julius Kohler, Michal Kern, Rudolf Sikora, Peter Bartosz, and many others. The most interesting thesis that Strauss is developing here concerns the parallel between art and interplanetary scientific research into non-anthropomorphic kind of communication. Universal interplanetary language was further developed by Miloš Laki and continued through concepts of pure sensibility by Filko, Laki, Zavarsky, the three artists together in their joint project, White Space in White Space. Strauss is actually one of the first art critics uh, in Czechoslovakia who recognized the role of art in predicting the future. I mean, this is something uh, for me really outstanding and uh, makes uh, and builds uh, really a specificity of Slovak conceptualism uh, next to, for example, Moscow conceptualism or uh, other uh, conceptualisms around the world. Okay, so let's move to the third part, uh, which is negotiating East European art. In this part of anthology, the last part, uh, we have two essential essays that were published in German in Strauss uh, monography Zwischen Ostkunst und Westkunst, which was published 1995. One of the terms that Strauss applied was the term Ostkunst. Uh, he didn't only use it, but he also constituted it. Um, and the whole terminology around uh, Ostkunst. Uh, allow me to give you a brief introduction to this topic as I have just finished the paper that I, in that I explore the background and the circumstances under which this term Ostkunst uh, emerged. And I investigated its origins regarding also the context uh, where it was constituted and developed. So first of all, uh, I investigated the term Ostkunst in connection with the exhibition Westkunst, uh, which Henry already mentioned. Uh, Strauss mentioned explicitly this exhibition Westkunst in his essay and argued very critical regarding the concept of this exhibition. Literally, he argued sarcastically what lies beyond the United States or in Europe to the east of Lüneburg is permanently excluded from the avant-garde. Basically, we could suggest this, that uh, the exhibition Westkunst was the expression of the development within Germany after the World War II. The concept of Westkunst corresponded with the Cold War rhetorics of Western Germany. To oversimplify now, after establishing socialist realism in Eastern Germany, there was a declared intention of Western Germany to identify itself with abstract art, which was considered to be free and democratic. This tendency was even more necessary as it was important to find a new identity in culture and to establish a border and signalize a conscious distance from the art of the national socialism. So basically during the Cold War, we have the East and West conflict that is distinguishable most notably in Germany as this country divided. Well, by entering into the framework of East-West conflict, 
Thomas Strauss, who emigrated to Western Germany at the beginning of the 1980s, reacted in his text directly on the ideological propaganda of Western Germany that tried to demonize the art of the so-called Eastern Bloc. By doing that, West German art discourse instrumentalized the entire cultural field with similar kinds of ideological loaded mechanisms as one could find in the public discourses of the Communist Party in Eastern Bloc. Strauss is direct witness of the Cold War in the cultural field, refuses to accept this discourse generated by political events. So Strauss identifies himself as a defender of Central European states in which the avant-garde and neo avant developed regardless of ideological political issues and rhetoric frameworks of proponents of Western culture. So the characteristics of Strauss' discourse constituting the notion of Ostkunst were published uh, in his essential lecture, which I can show you also now here. This is the lecture on Strauss in the Ostkunst, published 1994. It was a lecture uh, that he presented at Kunsthaus Lenkart in Cologne. And this lecture was published with Boris Groys. And Boris Groys is also um, um, dealing with this issue, gibt es eine Ostkunst? Is there a Ostkunst? And also in his book, uh, Zwischen Ostkunst und Westkunst, uh, I have showed you already. And I have also this third important publication here, which was uh, published as a volume from a conference, and Thomas Strauss was editor of it, and it was Westkunst, Ostkunst, Absonderung oder Integration. And I think this, uh, this question is really <laughs> very characteristic for the time after the fall of the Iron Curtain, because it was published in 1991. And uh, there was the question, what will happen with Westkunst? What will happen with Ostkunst? Are they going to be separated forever? Are they going to integrate into each other? So um, these are the basic, basic uh, works uh, he has published to this, uh, this problematic. And Strauss turned his attention to the artificial division between East and West uh, and makes an attempt to reassess the dominant view of art in Western Germany. So the question I would like to ask you, Daniel, now uh, is how do you reflect Strauss negotiating East European art and his essays uh, you included in this anthology? Mm -hmm. Thank you, the, uh, thank you, Andrea. Uh, I think uh, um, there, there are two, uh, two major essays on this topic in the, in the anthology. Um, I, uh, I think that, uh, unfortunately, Thomas Strauss uh, was uh, a bit overlooked uh, by uh, uh, art theorists and art critics uh, dealing with the issue of Eastern Europe. Um, there is uh, very little, there are very little quotations from his texts uh, in the, um, the texts uh, by, for example, Piotr Piotrowski, uh, or Boris Groys himself, you men men mentioned him, or others, uh, other important uh, uh, art historians, art critics, art theorists that uh, who, who uh, uh, are dealing, were dealing, or are dealing with uh, with um, uh, this issue. Um, from my point, I think we should return to the key concepts uh, that Thomas Strauss introduced because some. Discussions, of course, are embedded in the time, as you mentioned, but some of them are, I think, still uh, topical. Um, uh, I, uh, from my view, uh, this case study, uh, East-West case study, could be a good role model for uh, any uh, discussions uh, about, about uh, divisions, boundaries, uh, separations uh, that uh, uh, that might be uh, overcome uh, by art or uh, art criticism now in our world today. Uh, 
So I think uh, exhibition Westkunst, a contemporary art from uh, 1939, co co-curated by Laszlo Gloser and uh, Kasper Koenig in uh, 1981 in Cologne, gave him cause to reflect on Western audiences' ignorance of the multi-layered cultures of East and Central Europe. These essays, uh, real attunement to the present lies not so much in their introduction uh, of the term Ostkunst, but rather in that term's problematization. It's deepening by reference to various different cultural traditions. As a representative of the ethnic and linguistic minority group, uh, being Jewish and Hungarian within the common state of the Czechs and Slovaks, and later as a political emigre from communist Europe living in the West, Strauss enacts a survey that splinters the two still divided blocks of Europe in the uh, 1980s into a complex aggregation of internally differentiated entities. His essays gave the character of a personal diary in which the telegraphic capacities of the active journalist observer are fused with the work of the theorist, constantly rethinking his own standpoint. Strauss is an author who is intimately aware of both the strengths and weaknesses of Central European regionalisms, and his provocations are often aimed at his own corner of the world. Strauss devoted significant attention to the artists who, within their own environments, conceived radical modernist ideas from a minority position, like already mentioned Bartok, Kashak, Jasos, Koller, and others. According to Strauss, the distinct, distinct perspective of Central European nations consists precisely in their capacity to get to know and fruitfully engage with the cultures of others and above all the cultures, cultures of their immediate neighbors. Uh, for me, the key concept of the theoretical and critical work of Thomas Strauss is thus idea of plurality and tolerance. I think this is something we could get from his texts immediately. And uh, surely, as Andrea uh, introduced, we, it would be great if we go back to these discussions uh, that started in, uh, in late 80s or during the 80s and uh, culminated in 90s and uh, uh, to learn from, uh, from these discussions. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, there will be a lot of questions also in the discussion. So uh, I would uh, like to leave the floor for Henry and uh, we will have time and possibilities to, to answer questions also in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much indeed, Andre and Daniel, for uh, saying so much in so little time. And I'm sure there will be a lot of <clears throat> questions. We are, I, I have at least two comments to make, but I'd really like to ask, first of all, whether uh, Lisbeth, for instance, or Jean-Marc would like to ask something of our two uh, excellent speakers uh, from what they've just been telling us. Just an observation that it was very much interesting, the, the presentation of the colleagues, and uh, it gave us uh, an interest uh, of reading immediately the book. Uh, so I thank you very much for your presentation, your comments. It was very much uh, uh, interesting for us to know more about how the author 
uh, constructs his uh, thoughts and uh, develops his critics. Thank you. Jean-Marc, I'm sure I know that you have many questions. <laughs> we, we, we discussed this before. Uh, I, uh, 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 begin with uh, a small detail uh, question. Uh, the beginning of uh, the text of Kunst, uh, but with a question mark. Uh, Klaus uh, speak of uh, André Todt. Uh, was it important for him? Uh, he, has he wrote something? Did he wrote something uh, on André Todt? No, it's just a, a nearly private question because uh, I organized in 71 an exhibition on male art in, uh, in Paris where uh, I invited among other artists, André Todd. At that time, I, I didn't know exactly the scene, but his name was given by other, other people and so there were some uh, uh, some example of uh, works by, uh, from uh, Garin, Hungary, uh, Czechoslovakia, and other places where uh, I in, included uh, some of the artists which were beginning to work at that time. And I would like to know if there is something written by by uh, Thomas Strauss on, on that topic. Because uh, I've rediscovered the pieces I have at, at home also at the same time. Yes, uh, I, would, I would maybe answer now. Uh, uh, answer is yes. Uh, Strauss wrote uh, about uh, Andre Todd and I, I think that he knew him personally. Uh, and uh, uh, he he wrote. Um, I'm not sure. I don't have the book with me. Maybe Andrea can have a look. Uh, but I think that uh, in the book Zwischen Ostkunst und Westkunst, uh, von der Avantgarde zu, zur Postmodern, Postmodern yes, this in this book there might be a short text about Andre Todt, isn't it? Mm, I think uh, uh, he he wrote uh, a short text about him, or short essay. And uh, both, I think, were in touch uh, since uh, um, Andre Todt uh, lived uh, in Germany. I also think that they knew each other. Uh, I'm just looking into this text now because uh, actually uh, I can't really remember if he mentions him in explicitly uh, in a detailed way in this text. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but. I'm sure they knew each other because mm -hmm. uh, as immigrants in, in Western Germany, um, they, they met for sure. And Strauss had also very good uh, connections with Hungarian unofficial scene. So... Um, in this connection, maybe uh, I would mention uh, Laszlo Becke, uh -huh. uh, art yes. critic uh, from uh, Budapest. Uh, yes. There yes. are many letters, there are many letters between the two. Uh, they exchanged a lot with Thomas Strauss and uh, they were personal friends. And Laszlo Becke also introduced uh, Tomasz, a uh, Hungarian unofficial scene uh, in the 70s. And uh, there was mm -hmm. a very vivid um, correspondence between them. Yeah. Oh, fine. Uh, we we worked for for different uh, project with uh, Laszlo Becke, and especially for the Pierre Restani uh, conference uh, to which you uh, Andrea make reference uh, in the introduction. Uh, so uh, another question is uh, uh, about. Uh, the exhibition uh, Westkunst. Uh, there is one thing which struck me at that time is the fact that 
this exhibition uh, let be possible to interpret uh, uh, contemporary art history or modern art history without dealing with uh, art from from the borders, borders of uh, Westkunst. And at that time, there was a regression in the presentation of uh, the collection in the museum in the world, in the Museum of Contemporary Art or Modern Art, where uh, local things are, which are on the border uh, of the centrality of the of the modern and the contemporary art uh, scene, that is to say, the, the the French first and then the the, the American market, uh, the, the, the museum began to get rid in the presentation of the collection of works from South America, from Asia, which were where they were artists which uh, were completely recognized at the time by the, one of these markets and uh, and so Veskunst was uh, uh, in a way the occasion to get rid of these borders for 10 years or something like that before reintroducing them in another way and the fact of recognition of the globalization. And uh, so the, the point of view of uh, Thomas Strauss uh, is uh, insisting on the fact that uh, the, uh, this uh, separation between uh, East and West uh, transform the gaze on on the uh, on the world and themselves, and uh, and in a way uh, close the possibility to think really of what was uh, described as the central the central scene for modern and contemporary art and the borders and the, uh, the other parts of the world uh, from the other part of the world. So what, what uh, uh, do you think this uh, uh, Thomas Strauss has the occasion to see some of the collections transformation at that time and probably uh, the different presentation of uh, modern and contemporary art seen from the German museums in general. That is to say, the, the, the works which were hanged at that time change or get rid of some of, of marginal, uh, what was called marginal at, at that time. And uh, and did he did he use that to to push uh, his argument further? So maybe I I would uh, answer also to this question. Um, I have uh, analyzed this discourse about Ostkunst, Westkunst uh, by Thomas Strauss and uh, as he arrived to Germany in 1980 and then he started to work at uh, Wilhelm Leinbruck Museum in uh, Duisburg, yeah. I am uh, I, I can't read it in his text, uh, but I uh, presume that he has visited probably Aachen and the collection of Peter Ludwig. And uh, Peter Ludwig already at, at the end of the 1970s uh, started to exhibit uh, the artists from GBR. And uh, even there was um, uh, Pink who hang in his uh, collection, who has to be hanged 
thank uh, Daum and these artists from GDR were hanged uh, for a certain time. Mm. So I can imagine that uh, as he lived uh, in Duisburg and visited Cologne and Dusseldorf and Aachen, uh, that he has seen this, uh, this exhibition presentation of Peter Ludwig. And also I can imagine that he read a lot of uh, reviews about this kind of change which was happening also within Germany at that time. That somehow Eastern German art and Western German art started to, to be closer than before. So mm. uh, I can imagine it, uh, but he doesn't really mention um, Aachen and Peter Ludwig collection explicitly in his text. Uh, so I presuming that um, only. Yes. May, may I make a, a, a short comment and ask you a question, then perhaps bring in one or two of the uh, speakers who, who in some of the audience who want to ask some questions. Um, my first comment is a purely autobiographical one, right? It was that uh, I was one of a group of four or five curators who uh, first met formally in uh, November 19, uh, 1993 to discuss setting up a new Biennale, a new platform for young artists that would include artists from Eastern Europe, which was all the post-Berlin War affair, uh, which became Manifesta. And uh, I'd been working in Vienna myself uh, uh, at Museum uh, on projects uh, with Laurent Hagey uh, before that. And I was very attuned to the East uh, European situation. And I had just been reading um, the book by Thomas Strauss in German, Westkunst, Ostkunst. And I, I, I'm proud to say that I quoted that. And I said, we have no Eastern curators on our guiding committee. And we brought in two immediately, and a lot in bad from Poland and, and um, uh, from Slovenia. We had a curator there too. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I can honestly say that some of his thoughts fed into that, which was a very, very shared one in the early 90s, that we were in the West um, remarkably ignorant of what was happening, whereas in the East there was a very lively awareness of what, what had happened and what went wrong. And Thomas Strauss himself, uh, when he saw this Cold War confrontation, it always struck me as interesting, he analysed very rigorously the situation, and when he saw this clash, um, the universal of his aspirations Universalism of aspiration took him back, in a way, to the origins of modernism where he saw common source, or forward to some sort of utopian future, which is perhaps unattainable. Um, my, my, my question, and then I, I really must give others a chance to speak, uh, is that you uh, pointed me in the direction of this very interesting uh, publication of an exhibition two years ago to, to called Artists and Agents, by Katja Krasnohorka and uh, Sylvia Zasia, um, which does mention Milan Knizhak, for instance, in the 1960s, being uh, closely watched by the secret services. And obviously, there'd been some study of what was going on in, in, in Czech Republic as well as in Hungary and elsewhere in, in this uh, study here. There's no mention of Slovakia, but of course, uh, to be a, a dissident or a non-agreeing artist or a non-approved artist or to be kicked out of the Union of Artists had certain implications. Um, for instance, someone like Munachik organized public manifestations um, and one wonders what, what degree of complicity there might have been. Uh, I mean, it, it's very easy for us to see this as black and white. Uh, people had a very difficult life and, and struggled to survive. And to get things done, there, there were probably lots of social compromises needed. And uh, of course, Klaus is the first person to introduce us, uh, talk about the sociological and psychological elements of what he's doing. Um, do you have any concrete uh, information about collaboration between the Secret Services and some of the artists who are uh, spoken about by Klaus in, in the book, or indeed about any kind of um, uh, watch that was put on Strauss himself in control of his movements. Thank you, Henry. This is a very complex question, very complex and not easy to answer in, uh, in short time. I think it would need the whole seminar. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, the answer is yes. Um, there are 
um, there, uh, that there are cases uh, of collaboration with secret uh, services. Uh, artists were either examined uh, uh, or were forced to collaborate if they wanted to get passport or travel abroad. Uh, secret police was, was closely uh, examining art scene in Czechoslovakia because of a normalization and the situation in the country after 1968. Uh, it was a very difficult situation for many artists and um, uh, particularly I think uh, to answer your question, Alex Mlinarczyk was collaborator uh, for of Secret Police and uh, there uh, but uh, the problem is that uh, uh, that uh, the the files are empty they were they were discarded in the in the beginning of 90s and uh, we cannot find uh, um, a lot also stano filko was first uh, uh, collaborator then his status changed into uh, examined person uh, so uh, so tomas strauss also was a collaborator and then examined, but not in the field of culture, but in the field of so-called Sionism. Uh, uh, Secret Police was, was uh, 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 especially interested in uh, a Jewish uh, uh, intellectuals, intelligentsia, and uh, uh, their connections. Uh, and the uh, situation was in Czechoslovakia to, 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 to really short, shortly answer was uh, different from the 50s. In the 50s, 1950s, people went to prison uh, where uh, many of them lost lives in prison. In the, in the 70s, the situation in Czechoslovakia was still difficult, but uh, but uh, not that much as in the 50s during Stalinism. So uh, 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 artists uh, like, uh, like Alex Mlinarczyk could organize his, um, his uh, so-called total actions on the streets, but he had to have, he had to have official, official approval uh, from the police. And also as he tried to uh, to cross the border and emigrate when he, when he was uh, in teenager, he was uh, caught on the border and then imprisoned and uh, based on that later was forced to collaborate with secret, secret police. Uh, uh, so um, there is not, this is not the singular case, there are more. Uh, this is a very difficult, still, still nowadays very difficult topic. Uh, and artists do not like to speak about it. And the second problem, the second problem is that uh, many uh, files, we have the institution um, with, uh, which uh, uh, holds the, the, uh, the files of, uh, and archives of secret police services, uh, so-called HTB, uh, uh, but uh, Many of them were, as I said, uh, discarded, destroyed uh, in early 90s. So it's, uh, it's, it, it is not easy uh, to track back uh, 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 and it needs really uh, um, very, a lot of patience and uh, uh, um, to consulting, consult, consulting with uh, specialists, historians, archivists. Uh, so I think this chapter uh, was uh, it's great that uh, that uh, Silvia Sasse um, and um, uh, Katarina Krasnoverka op opened that issue. I know them personally, and it's really great achievement. I think uh, the topic uh, really necessary to discuss. Uh, um, but the problem in uh, uh, in uh, Czechoslovakia is that, uh, or particularly Slovak uh, files are not complete at the moment, so it's difficult to find uh, a proper evidence. Thank you very much. It's very, very interesting. It's worth reminding ourselves that we don't have uh, access to any files in Western countries at the moment, and haven't had. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 an artistic manifestation in public would certainly need police permission. So it's a complicated issue. It's complicated. <laughs>
Uh, Maybe I would like to add uh, just shortly uh, that uh, mm -hmm. after this publication and this exhibition, Performance Art and uh, Secret Services, um, I found this book uh, so amazing. Uh, I made also a review for art margins of it. It inspired me indeed uh, to, to start research in Secret Service Archive in Bratislava. Uh, it's a memory archive uh, of National, National Memory Archive. And I have started this research last summer and asked for some files. Uh, I have found some files uh, about Alex Minarchik, for example, but these are not really uh, saying something about this collaboration. There should be some file also in Prague, but it was lost. So um, we really don't know if he was a collaborator or not. As, as it is now stands today, uh, it's not really sure. And uh, there are also um, files about other, other artists, but it's very, very difficult uh, to to look for this information because one information is in one file and this is a very complex uh, archive and uh, I'm sure um, there is material also about Thomas Strauss. Uh, I also asked for this material but uh, because of Corona it was uh, stopped and paused uh, for several months but uh, uh, I would like to go uh, go on with this research and maybe in the future we will know more. I also would like to know more about Pierre Estani and about his collaboration mm. uh, and cooperation between uh, France and uh, Czechoslovakia at that time. Because I'm sure these uh, persons were observed and uh, there are probably many information in these secret files uh, that we could also need for our our art historian uh, research. Yeah. I think there's also there maybe there's something in the Archive de Critique d'Art in Rennes about uh, uh, which have uh, much of the Estanese material. Yeah, yes, but uh, the, we we don't find anything on Thomas Quas directly. Mlinasek, uh, they are they are things. But I, I didn't went through uh, specifically. Uh, I made Milasik in several occasions, uh, but the archives we have are the archives by by Restani, uh, and uh, I think they are linked to one uh, one event. Uh, uh, or, Another and all the, with all the documentation on, on that, or the question of preparation and so on. Uh, we had one communication in the Restani conference on, on the topic, and Nenasek was there to 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 speak of his work, uh, and it was included also in the in the publication which came after. But uh, I, I didn't when uh, I didn't go to the to the files myself. Mm -hmm. well, I try to to search on Thomas Cross, uh, and this I, I can uh, I can say we have nearly nothing. <laughs> so uh, this book will be a beginning to to collect uh, books and so on. But uh, uh, it, it was not the case for other, other art critics. But uh, this means that uh, he, he was not active uh, through the, the, the Biennale, for instance. Or uh, there were two possibilities during the 60s, 70s in France is either to be to an international manifestation like exhibition like the Biennale or to uh, to be uh, on the uh, uh, independent art critique uh, with uh, 
from the, the independent art critics uh, scene, uh, like Pierre Estani, Ragon, and others, uh, which are uh, a specific group which is opposed to the Museum of Modern Art at, the, at that time. And, uh, and so there are different aims, different uh, artists in the different places and so on. If you want to, to work on the archives of Musée uh, National d'Art Contemporain, d'Art Modern, that is to say in uh, the collection in uh, the Centre Pompidou, you will see that there are holes in some subjects on some topics, uh, which are uh, uh, ears in, in the Archive de la Critique d'Art and the opposite. Thank you. I'm conscious that time is, is, is moving on. Uh, we have at least one question from um, the audience. Before we move on to that, there's a comment from um, uh, Oliver Bortar, uh, who said that uh, he first heard of Thomas Strauss in 1980 from Lazarus Becker, and I have no doubt he says that he knew Andrei Trout and Geja Pernetsky in Cologne. Uh, so that's, that's a sort of partial comment on that. Um, but then there's a question uh, rather than a comment uh, from uh, Nilofar Farooq in Pakistan. He says, do you have any information on Thomas Strauss's collaboration with other art critics from Eastern Europe? Does he mention their response to the divide between Eastern art and Western art? So maybe I could put that to Andrea or to Danielle. Okay. okay, so maybe just uh, shortly uh, uh, to answer that question, uh, we already prob mentioned or uh, Henry already mentioned uh, um, a Czech uh, art critic, very famous one, uh, uh, Indrich Kalupecki. They were close friends and uh, they exchanged uh, many, many letters. Uh, so I, uh, from the Czech part, also Jiří Kotalík, uh, and um, yes, um, probably these two. And uh, as we already mentioned, Laszlo Becke from Hungary. Then I think uh, Strauss was in touch with uh, Richard Stanislavski, uh, um, who was uh, in charge of the museum in Łódź. And uh, then uh, organ uh, he was also uh, one of the curators of Europa, Europa exhibitions, exhibition uh, in Bonn. Uh, in uh, the catalog of this exhibition, uh, Tomasz Strauss wrote a very nice essay on, uh, on Knižák, uh, Stembera and Mlinarczyk, uh, comparing their, uh, their um, performative work and uh, uh, I am pretty much sure that Thomas Strauss was uh, in um, uh, in touch with uh, Russian uh, art critics and uh, historians researching uh, avant-garde, uh, historical avant-garde, I mean. Uh, so um, I think that he had multiple contacts in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Russia or Soviet Union at the time. Uh, uh, so I, I'm sure that not, not, not only artists like Ivan Chuiko or Ilya Kabako uh, were, um, uh, did, did know him, but also uh, um, art critics. Uh, but uh, I haven't done uh, uh, so much research uh, in that field. It, it, would be, it would be something to do in the future, like to track these contacts uh, Strauss had in uh, in Soviet Union. Uh, did, did he know? Did he knew uh, uh, the uh, the art historian uh, Turovsky, Petr Turovsky? Turovsky. From, yes. Uh, uh, they. I think uh, the, uh, I read the uh, one book by Turovsky, and uh, they have uh, very similar topics 
uh, and uh, also sometimes uh, uh, quite close uh, thesis, but I'm not sure if they if they knew each other. I, I don't know. Yes, because he, he, he did a long time in France. I don't mm -hmm. know if she's if he's still there or if he came back to to Poland. But, uh, but uh, he, he was part of uh, our scientific uh, co uh, committee in the archives. So we have things from him, but uh, and he. But I, I don't know which files because uh, he was still very active. So he kept all his uh, archives on microfilms. Mm -hmm. uh, just one last thing, I, because I think we, uh, unfortunately, we're running right out of time. There's a comment here from uh, Daniel Perrier, uh, which you may have seen, which says uh, there was a very interesting exhibition at. Hardware Medienkunstverein, artists and agents, performance kunst and Geheimdienst, where performance art and secret agents in 2020. So, if anyone is interested in following that. Um, but uh, unfortunately, the time seems to run out on us. And I, I would just like very specially um, to thank, well, of course, our president, uh, Lisbeth Odoyo, and the editor of the series, Jean Marc Guanso, but most especially our speakers from um, Bratislava, Andrea Batarova, and Daniel Grun. Um, but Daniel, for his hard work on the book, and both of you for the wonderful research you've done in this area and for sharing it with us this afternoon. Um, thank you all very much indeed. It's been a, a really stimulating session. Time's gone rather too fast for me anyway. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks uh, also for my part and thank you very much one more time for the invitation. It was really very inspiring discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Lisbeth, do you want to... Thank you very much. Just to thank everybody that uh, follow us, follow this webinar. It, uh, it was uh, very much uh, uh, grateful to see the colleagues from all over the world and to have the opportunity to listen to the two specialists that have uh, collaborated for the publication of this book. And uh, I want to thank you, Harry and Jean-Marc for this uh, extraordinary publication. I'm very anxious to, to read the book. I haven't received it up to now. So I'm very much curious and uh, everything I heard today uh, shows me that it is really a very important critic and uh, it is important for us to know uh, better uh, what happens in different parts of the world. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you all to, to have come. Mm, thank you very much, uh, Lisbeth, and uh, if there are further, I see that there are many questions. If there are further questions, uh, me or Andrea would be happy to answer by email or uh, personally. So if you feel that some, some um, uh, uh, issues remain open. Please don't hesitate to to get back to us. Uh, we will be happy to uh, further uh, discuss the issues that we opened uh, today. Thank you very much.